So, Joel, we're going to talk about the book of Isaiah. The superscription of the book here is the vision of Isaiah, son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. That's an but awfully long career. Uh, most prophets, you can sort of narrow down to they were talking in one sort of small slice of, uh, of time, but he's got a half a century, really, of coverage. He's got, he's got a coverage. good 40 years, anyhow. Uh, yeah. Uzziah is said to have died in 742, I think it's usually put, and then he lives through the invasion of Sennacherib. So he's down to 701. Down, yeah, so he's a good 40 years in action, whereas Amos seems to have been in and out of there in a, in a year at most, right. maybe a week. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's got, and and he's engaging with that entire history, right? He's he's not uh, he's not timeless, sort of not timeless messages. Uh, he's right. really like concerned with what's happening in the world around him. So what was going on? So this is by the end of the eighth century. I mean, you just mentioned Sennacherib. We're really at the height of Assyrian power. Right, this is uh, real domination by uh, foreign empire, uh, in a way that I'm not sure that Israel had really experienced uh, before, at least not to this degree. Not, not at least since Israel became a nation. Right. Let's say, you know, you had had a, a sweeping invasion by an Egyptian pharaoh, but he was in and out, whereas now you have a steamroller. Right. And you, they they came in waves. Right, and it's affecting the entire world around them, so they can see it. They can see it coming from from far away, right? This is not just uh, uh, this is not a momentary thing. This is uh, this is earth changing for really for all of the peoples uh, of that uh, time and place. It is, in fact, it's remarkable that all the prophets of the eighth century know very well what's happening with Syria. And now Isaiah, I would figure, was probably an educated man in his way, mm -hmm. at least somebody who moved in the circles of the court. You might expect him to know things, but even uh, people like Amos, who were out in the boonies, right. knew what was happening. Right. Amos can say, um, "I'm not a you're right. I'm not a prophet." Yeah. Uh, but he still knew, and Isaiah, who really is the definition of exactly the kind of prophet that Amos says, "I'm not." Right. That is somebody who yeah. is speaking sort of a professional. Yeah, our colleague Bob Wilson distinguishes between central intermediaries and peripheral. Now, the central intermediary is somebody who actually works for the government, mm -hmm. works for the king, and Isaiah is your prime example oh, yeah. of that. Uh, whereas Amos or Elijah would be prime examples of the peripheral prophet, free loner, out in the country somewhere, freelancer. Right. I mean, as we're going to see, we've got stories about Isaiah effectively being an advisor to the, to the monarch. Yeah, which makes him a very interesting character, I think. Now, what's going on, though, then, coming back to the Assyrians for the moment, mm -hmm. you have waves of invasions. Yeah. So they come through northern Israel first time about 738. Mm -hmm. You've some deportation already. Then they come back. Then you have a, an episode that we will need to talk about in a few minutes of the syro ephraimite war, mm -hmm. when they were debating whether or not they should try to form an alliance to resist Assyria. And then Assyria comes and wipes the northern kingdom of Israel off the map. Yeah, 721, 722, somewhere right Which in there. Which has huge implications both for Israel, Judah, and for the Bible, mm -hmm. really, because from that point on, it's going to be only Judah, even though we end up calling it Israel yeah, at some point. That's right. And, and for mm -hmm. uh, Isaiah, and for everybody who lived through sort of watching the North fall, and for the next 150 years until the South falls as well, right, the, the memory of what that looked like and the you know, removal of more than half of Israel's sort of ancestral, or at least understood to be ancestral territory, becomes you know, sort of the nightmare that, uh, that fuels everything that they do. Right? So Isaiah and everybody else watch this happen. And how do we avoid this? Is it actually just inevitable that it's going to happen to us too? What's it going to look like? And this, uh, you know, the whole 
notion of Jerusalem as uh, inviolable. Right? Jerusalem is, is in, that may have happened yeah. to the entire north, but Jerusalem is going to stay or not um, becomes central really after, uh, after the north falls and everybody sees just what is at stake, really. And then they come within a hair yeah. of, uh, of falling in the time of Sennacherib, towards mm -hmm. the end of Isaiah's career, and somehow or other, they come through it. So maybe the, the fact that uh, Isaiah prophesied that they would survive, helped him survive. As a book. As, as a book. Yeah. Uh, for all of these prophets, I figure the reason we have them is their prophecies were thought to be fulfilled. Right. That Amos was very it's grateful for that earthquake. Close enough. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So, when we think about Isaiah and his prophecies, we talk about the relationship with with Assyria. That's true for much of the book of Isaiah, but as we know, not not all of it. Right? There's a there's a moment, uh, sort of two thirds of the way through, where suddenly we're not talking about Assyria anymore. Yes. Now this is the biggest of the prophetic books, I think. Oh, yes. A uh, huge book. Yeah. And when you're reading along, <laughs> suddenly, in chapter 40 to be precise, if you're paying attention at all, you know the whole context has shifted. Right. It goes from uh, <coughs> prophecies of impending doom and uh, castigations of idolatry and misbehavior and pride. Uh, and suddenly, in chapter 40, of course, we have the very, the very famous comfort Oh, yes. my people. Uh, and from then on, it's a, a completely different, not only in tone, uh, from oracles and proclamations of destruction to proclamations of comfort, but in terms of what seemed to be historical referent also, Isaiah suddenly no longer is talking about the Assyrians, but is praising Cyrus. Even <laughs> mentioned Cyrus by name. Right. So of course, the, the great Persian king who destroyed not even Assyria, but Babylon, yes. uh, so there were two empires later than when we started. Now, one of the remarkable things about the, the way prophecy has been read through the centuries is that nobody drew the obvious conclusion until about 200 years ago. Yeah. Less, in fact, I think, that uh, these later chapters were not actually from Isaiah of Jerusalem, from the original Isaiah. Right. And you, you'd know that, I mean, just from the superscription, as we said, right? He only lived through Hezekiah. He certainly yeah. didn't live for another 200 years, which is what it would take to yeah. get down to the Persians. But the way prophecy was read for a long time, this wasn't seen to be a problem. Right. A I mean, prophet was supposed to know the future. Right. I think part I, of that is the classical definition of prophecy as it came to be was exactly that, was, was sort of seeing the future and anticipating and predicting what was going to happen. But I don't think that's really at all what is happening in the biblical prophets. And Isaiah, for the, the Isaiah of chapters 1 through 39, least of all, he's almost never sort of predicting the future. But again, we will deal with several passages which were thought to predict things that came centuries later than Cyrus of Persia. Right. And were thought to predict the coming of the Messiah and even to predict it in a way that was fulfilled. Uh, this was the traditional Christian reading of mm -hmm. it. So this began to change, it changed in some quarters, not everywhere. Uh, really in the late 19th century, there was a famous German scholar named Bernard Doom, mm -hmm. which is a great name for somebody working <laughs> on the prophets. Uh -huh. Because one of his theses indeed was that the great prophets were all people who preached doom. Mm -hmm. As by and large, they, they were. were. <laughs> <laughs> he was right on that. Now, in the case of Isaiah, there was a legend in antiquity that he was, the way he died was that he was martyred. And he, he was sawn asunder with a wooden saw in the time of Manasseh. And so when Doom published his book declaring that this book doesn't all come from one prophet, but comes from a couple of different prophets. Somebody published a review saying, sawn asunder again. <laughs> <laughs> but it's of, of, this is one of those results of German scholarship that was clearly, indisputably right. Yeah, the, nobody anymore really makes an, anything like an argument for the continuity of the book of Isaiah. Uh, 
but you, so we do have two yeah. significant chunks, right? One through 39, though, as we'll see, of course, with the text this yeah. long and this old, there's always additions and uh, little tweaks to it here and there, and we'll come across one of those later on. But 1 through 39 being largely attributable to the Isaiah of the superscription, the Isaiah who lived in yeah. Jerusalem and talked to the kings. And, um, and so this now gets to be called First Isaiah. Right, sometimes Proto-Isaiah, but we'll go with First Isaiah. And of course, from chapters 40 through 66 is known as Second Isaiah. And fortunately, uh, we have a series of Bible study videos on those as well. well but and in fact, even within that later part, most people would also distinguish Third Isaiah in chapters 56 to 66. And even all that isn't necessarily one prophet. Right. Uh, so we, I mean, we have to remember, not only do we have uh, you know, the book that's divided into multiple authors, one of whom was probably named Isaiah. That is, our, our Isaiah yes. is probably Isaiah. And whoever wrote the rest of it attached themselves to the name of this great prophet from the 8th century. Or, the, or their oracles got copied onto the same scroll, which I think is a factor in the formation of biblical books that we often don't acknowledge sufficiently, that what was put on one scroll depended on how much space they had. Right. And so this was a long one. But okay. But I mean, yeah. it was a long one to begin with, right? The, the prophecies of the first Isaiah is already by itself about the longest prophetic book that we have, even without second and third Isaiah. And yeah. long, I mean, again, 40 years worth of prophesying through a whole series of historical events, we shouldn't act as if this all came at the same time. We shouldn't act as if uh, the book is going to be necessarily completely internally consistent, even within the same prophet, right? He's, he's reacting to the world around him, uh, as all the prophets did. So there's, you know, I, I think that what we're looking at really is the, the sort of constant shift of one person's understanding of Israel's relationship with the deity as reflected in and understood through the lens of the incredible historical shifts that were going on around him, the fall of the north, the Syro-Ephraimite yeah. war, the but rise of e Syria. Even allowing for shifts within the, the thinking and preaching of one prophet, very few people would say that all of 1 to 39 actually comes from Isaiah of Jerusalem. And there are some large chunks of it that can be set aside. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those is there's a long, several chapters of oracles against foreign nations. Mm -hmm. Now, some of them may go back to Isaiah. Some of them seem to be relating to the fall of Babylon at a much later time. Right. Uh, we will talk a bit about chapters 24 to 27. Yeah. Which most people think is a much later composition and, I mean, almost coherent <laughs> in itself. Right. And then we have the story about the Assyrians at Le sending up messengers from Lachish, uh, which appears almost verbatim in the Book of Kings mm -hmm. and probably is more at home in the Book of Kings than it is in the Book of Isaiah, but we can talk about that. Right. So, you know, when you whittle all of those down, you get a much more manageable corpus of prophecies of Isaiah. But even so, it's still a substantial one. It is. Uh, and we're going to sort of jump in uh, to the book itself in the next segment, uh, not with the very beginning of the book in chapter one, but with maybe the beginning of the story of Isaiah, which is uh, Isaiah's sort of call to prophecy. Yeah. <laughs> 